Hello, gunfighters, and welcome to Gunfighter Life, the podcast where we talk about guns, firearms, shooting, tactics, self-defense, the right way, with God at the center, Judeo-Christian values, and real-world first-hand experience. What are we going to talk about today? Top 5 22 long rifle handguns for concealed carry because I'm here to serve you guys and some of the top episodes as of late have been 22 long rifle for defense meaning how good is it ballistically is it effective and then 22 handguns for survival which I was surprised to see the metric that I looked at did better than 22 rifles for survival so 22 handguns seem to be a hot topic, and again, I'm here to serve you. So with the training and experience that God's blessed me to have, I'm going to try and serve you today. Talking about the top-rated defensive and or CCW handguns in 22. On that training and experience, I'm going to plug in the bio, and then we'll get into the main topic. First and foremost, I am a Christian. That is number one in my life, serving God, following Jesus. Combat veteran, served in the United States Marine Corps and the Army. Also, law enforcement veteran, private contractor, state rifle and pistol champion. Professional big game hunter and guide. If you feel called to support, check out Patreon. There should be a link in the show notes. With that, I am your host. Michael Melito, and I am blessed to serve you today. Now, I did a whole other episode on 22 for defense. Before you start railing on this episode, if you haven't listened to that one, you might want to listen to that one first. I am not telling you that 22 long rifle is the best defensive caliber. I'm not telling you it's the best CCW caliber. What I am stating is that people buy 22 handguns and carry 22 handguns for defense instead of just thumbing your nose up at that or us as the gun collective thumbing your nose up at that let's embrace all shooters and i think a lot of new shooters wisely would be served going to a 22 first and until the point where they progress that 22 handgun may be their only handgun so let's embrace the gun community whether that's a freckled-faced kid running around on a farm getting his first 22, or the purple-haired barista at Starbucks with 27 piercings. There's a lot of new kinds of people coming into the gun community. If we want to maintain the right guaranteed by the Second Amendment, it behooves us to welcome new shooters and help them. And I think 22 is a wise place to start. And although I'm not telling you 22 is the best defensive caliber by far, what I am telling you is it's certainly better than not having a handgun. With that, let's talk about what are, in my opinion, my experience, the best 22 handguns for defense. I'm going to start out with one that... I couldn't even fathom how many rounds I've had through. Smith & Wesson M&P 22. They used to make a full size. That's what I have because I used to compete with a Smith & Wesson M&P. And I had the full size 22 analogous to that for training, which is a great thing I would encourage you to do. A gun like that will probably pay for itself if you shoot quite a bit. But I have, I could again, I can't even fathom how many rounds I've had through that M&P 22. It was given to me by a dear friend and fellow gunfighter. I don't know a lot of true actual gunfighters. I consider him to be one. He is no longer walking this earth, but he gave me that gun and I still have it and I still train with it. It's in my range bag. It's one of the guns I often take out. The Smith & Wesson M&P 22. Now for this, for defense and carry, you're probably looking at the compact model. But either way, one of the great things about the Smith & Wesson M&P 22 is it's very similar in form and function. The compact one, very similar to like a Smith & Wesson shield, which is a great, great carry gun. In fact, when I talked about kind of the development of concealed carry since the 1990s, the Smith & Wesson 
MMP shield kind of revolutionized what you could have as a carry gun. It was one of the first like game changers on the scene. Well, they make that similar size gun in a 22, and you're going to get less recoil. And I know they make the Smith and Wesson EZ in a 380 and a 9 millimeter, but you get a lot more recoil, and the ammunition's more expensive. So for somebody just getting into it, they want to get into it, they want to try, they want to practice. Or they want something analogous to that gun they already have, the Smith & Wesson Shield or the Smith & Wesson Full Size MMP. The Smith & Wesson MMP 22s are fantastic. The good thing about those is, since the center fire counterparts are pretty common, getting a good defensive holster, CCW holster, whether you want inside the waistband, outside the waistband, leather, kydex, going to be really easy to get a holster for that that actually fits that gun. I would advise against, I know not a lot of new shooters do, but I would advise against like a one size fits most handgun holster. And the ability to get good holsters for this, because concealed carry is a system, right? It's not just a gun. A lot of people just focus on the gun. It's primarily, I would say, focus on the ammunition and the bullet, because that's what's going to get the work done. And then the handgun, the magazines, the belt, the holster, all that works together. You could have a fantastic gun and a horrible holster, horrible belt. Thing slides all over the place. When you go to draw it, it's in a different place every time. Your draw is inconsistent and slow and inaccurate. It's a system. So the ability to get good common holsters for this gun, I think, gets it on the list. And the fact that the standard ones have good ergonomics, and the 22 versions of the MMP have good ergonomics. So really a good, solid choice in the Smith & Wesson MMP 22. Especially if you're getting this for a training gun for yourself, or you're getting it for somebody else, a family member, or somebody you're giving it as a gift to. You want to bring them into the firearms fold, and you're hoping they'll progress to something else and you want them to be familiar because it loads the same way you know the slide works the same way so if they get familiar with the operations loading unloading emergency reloads tack reloads with that it's going to be a very smooth transition if they get something pretty similar the next one i'm going to talk about i carry a full-size fighting handgun day to day as my ccw most of the time there are days when I don't. There are days I go to like an ultralight EDC, but in general, I carry a full-size fighting handgun. If you're talking about this is your primary carry gun and you decide for whatever reason to carry it in 22, instead of getting a gun, the Smith & Wesson MP22s are great, but instead of getting a gun that was designed as a center fire and then getting the version of it in a 22, I would say get one designed from the ground up to be reliable and effective with a 22 long rifle cartridge because you're dealing with a much smaller cartridge you don't need that whole reciprocating slide and locking system so something designed from the ground up like a ruger or a buckmark i'm going to focus on the ruger i think it has better ergonomics the ruger mark 4 2245 light to be very specific any of these the ruger mark one two three or four are all good guns the mark four is much easier to clean if you've ever cleaned one of the older versions it can often be an exercise in frustration especially trying to get it back together if that doesn't bother you those versions are fine i recommend the 2245 version because the other versions while very good and accurate have a pretty extreme grip angle and if you want continuity of training you want to be able to pick up other handguns and have a smooth transition the 2245 has very similar ergonomics to a 1911 and in my opinion 1911s have fantastic ergonomics and a lot of other guns share that same grip angle and why the light well because it's a lot lighter if you're going to carry it. it's still a big gun however it's light. It's a lightweight gun. The kind of a pencil thin steel barrel, which is pretty much all you need for the 22, wrapped in, I believe, an aluminum shroud for a bull barreled handgun that's pretty light and very accurate and very reliable because it's designed from the ground up. It doesn't have a slide that moves back and forth, it has a bolt inside. In my opinion, a better system, less movement of that gun while shooting. Also, really accurate because it has fixed sights that are fixed to the barrel, and they don't reciprocate. 
Also, since it's a solid top, not like a conventional handgun that doesn't move back and forth, really easy to mount optics on. Really easy. So if you were going to carry a full-size 22, I would really recommend the 2245 Lite. If you were looking at a good, reliable, full-size 22, let's say that's going to be your carry gun. And size really isn't a big issue, but you want something reliable, I absolutely would recommend that. Now, not all people that can still carry carry semi-automatic handguns. Many carry revolvers. I mentioned my ultralight EDC. For me, that's a 5-shot 357 Magnum 360 PD. Fantastic gun. I am a fan of revolvers for a lot of things. They have a lot of advantages. I'm not saying they're better. I don't carry one most of the time, but they do have their advantages. They have an additional advantage in 22, in that 22 ammunition is not the most reliable. It's rimfire ammunition. It's made to be affordable, and in general, it's not as reliable as center fire ammo. So, if you get a failure to fire in a semi auto 22 center fire, whatever, it's tap rack, bang, or tap roll rack, whatever your acronym that you've been taught, right? And you have to do that take your sights off target, slap the bottom of the magazine while rack the slide, hopefully, and chamber a new round. With the revolver, you get a failure to fire. You simply pull the trigger again, and you get a fresh round rotated into the firing position. So you don't have to worry about it. You just pull the trigger again. Sights can stay on target, and you literally just have to pull the trigger again. That's a big advantage. I think a much bigger advantage in 22 than center fire because modern defensive center fire ammo is pretty reliable. 22 ammunition is much less so. Also, a lot of 22 ammunition and good 22 ammunition is coated with a wax coating. This can be an issue if you have a round that fails to fire and you go to do the tap rack bang. A lot of times that wax can get that round stuck in the chamber. Not if it fires because it's going to be hot and it's going to be slick. That's kind of the point. But if it's cold, in my experience, sometimes you can have trouble getting that extractor to rip that round out. So, again, revolvers have even... An additional advantage here. So let's talk about some really good 22 carry revolvers. Now there are other models, but Smith & Wesson J-Frames are a fantastic carry gun. In fact, that was the first carry gun I bought with my own money. It was my backup gun for LAPD. They issued us a duty gun, but we had to buy our own backup gun. I bought a Smith & Wesson J-Frame in 38 Special, as did many others. I still have that gun. It's a good gun. So if I'm going to recommend my number one recommendation for a revolver in 22, now the one I got was in 38 Special, but I'm going to recommend a J-Frame. And there's different models of J-Frame in 22 Long Rifle. The one I think would fit this niche the most is going to be the 43. If you look up the Model 43, there's all kinds of numbers and have fun trying to keep the numbers of Smith & Wesson guns straight as to what they are. But the 43 is a J-frame, hammerless, good, sleek, small carry 22. So if you're looking for a 22 that will be a good pocket carry gun or a good deep concealment gun, a good backup gun in 22, or just an ultra light, super small. 22 revolver. Look at that Smith & Wesson J-frame in the 43. Now that's a hammerless model. A lot of people prefer that. I honestly don't. I actually like a hammer. And I have I know that bucks the tradition of what most people recommend. But I'm telling you for me, and I've carried one for years and years and years, I like a hammer. Sometimes I want to take a longer shot. Sometimes I want that better trigger pull. And people will say it gets caught up in the pocket there are very simple solutions to that, like when you grab it, having your thumb up and high, which is the way I shoot anyway, which guards that hammer from getting snagged. But anyway, I'm going to recommend the 43. It's a hammerless Smith & Wesson J-frame. However, the next one I'm going to talk about is going to have a hammer. But just realize they do make the J-frames with a hammer if you do want that. But the Ruger LCR was one of the first attempts to kind of modernize because the J-frames have been around for decades. Well, sometimes I forget 
how long I've been shooting, and I consider the LCR a new gun, but maybe the LCR has been around for decades by now. It was a kind of a modern take. It wasn't just a copy of a Smith & Wesson or a Colt. Many companies, Taurus and things like that, will copy those patent-expired designs, but the Ruger LCR kind of did its own thing in that they came out with a J-frame style, a small stub nose revolver style, with a little bit different ergonomics, a polymer or a polymer slash metal frame, which was pretty new in the revolver world, and a kind of completely different trigger mechanism than most revolvers. Now, the Ruger LCR also comes in a 22 long rifle. Now the Ruger LCR, and then years later they came out with the LCR X. X stands for the hammer. Maybe that stands for exposed hammer. Maybe it's just cool marketing with the X on there. But the LCR X, they make a model in 22. Since we already gave a pocket revolver, this one I'm going to recommend is a little bit bigger. It's got a 3-inch barrel, which 3-inch barrels are kind of known for their good midsize revolver ability to be able to conceal it. So if you wanted to carry on a belt holster inside the waistband, outside the waistband, whatever the case is, it would be a great, great revolver for this. If you wanted a good mid-sized revolver that was really shootable, very fun and pleasant to shoot, good for training new shooters, good for just going out and getting a lot of training and trigger time in without spending a lot of money, if you don't like punishing recoil, I think it's a really good option. Looks like it comes with really good adjustable sights. A weight of 17.3 ounces, which is pretty light. It's not as light as my Scanium frame J-frame, but it's pretty light. And it has 8-round capacity. I should go back and mention that J-frame that I mentioned, the 43, also has 8-round capacity. That's pretty common because the rounds obviously are smaller. And that one weighs very similar to my 357 in 11 0.4 ounces. So that one's much lighter, but that Ruger, again, is not very heavy for a mid-size gun. Now, when you look at the prices of these, you might think well, those are about as much money as the centerfire as a 357 Magnum. And yeah, they pretty much are. Because if you think about what it takes to make a revolver, it's really not any cheaper. They're probably built on exactly the same frames. They use the same cylinders. Granted, they're going to be bored to different specs, bored to 8 round 22 versus 6 round, it's a 357 38 special. But really, the amount of money it costs to make them in 22 is going to be about the same. Whereas with a semi auto, you can get a little bit cheap on them. You can make them with a very subpar slide material or whatever because it's not getting punished like it would be in a heavier caliber. I think with most of these revolvers, the ones that I'm talking about, the quality ones, they're pretty much made the same, so they're going to cost about the same as the centerfire option. Okay, what if you just want to go top end with a 22 handgun? You're like, 22 handgun is what I want to carry and trust my life to, and I don't want to go cheap. I want the best of the best. Well, Vorkwartzen has you covered. Volkortzen is a name that's probably well known if you're into like the competitive shooting world, but other than that, you may not be aware of Volkortzen. They make really good, really high-end stuff, mostly for 22s. Brief aside, if you're looking for a much better trigger than what comes on your factory 1022, the Volkortzen trigger kit is awesome. I highly recommend. They also make complete guns. They make complete handguns. One of the ones they make is the Black Mamba, and it's just a thing of beauty. It's like the McLaren of 22 handguns, or the 60s era Shelby Cobra, whatever your taste is. It's a strikingly good-looking, well-built 22 handgun. Now, these are loosely based on the Ruger design, which we already talked about, which I think, in my opinion, is the best 22 handgun design these are kind of that made to a different level of quality and craftsmanship. Kind of like going from like a Chevy GMC to like a Cadillac. So if that's what you're looking for, they make one called the Mamba Mini. If you've ever felt a trigger, like a Volkortzen 22 trigger, it is superb. It's maybe one of the only triggers that 
could rival a good 1911 trigger. They are phenomenal triggers. As you might expect, the Mini Mamba is going to come with phenomenal iron sights, really good iron sights. It's going to come with a rail on it already for mounting an optic. And remember I said that design where nothing moves in relation to the barrel, like the sights are fixed to the barrel and the optics mount is affixed to the same upper end barrel, it lends itself to crazy accuracy. So if that's what you're looking for, speed, accuracy, the best of the best in a 22 handgun, they do make the Mini Mamba. And it's really, really cool. If you said, for whatever reason, you have to carry a 22 handgun, like you have to carry it. There, there's some new, and let's hope this never happens, but they're doing something where all detachable box magazine semi-auto firearms are banned. Center fire. But you can have a rim fire, so I had to carry a rim fire handgun for defense, and it was going to be my one, like my primary and maybe my only defensive handgun, and it had to be in 22. If I were blessed enough to have it, I would not feel bad about carrying this gun. It is a phenomenal handgun. You might be thinking that I forgot one, but I don't think I have, and that would be the new SIG 22 that's kind of loosely based on their 365. You might think that would be a shoe in However, it does not meet one of the criteria that I have preached to you guys about before. Don't be a beta tester in a gunfight. My general rule is I like for a model to be out for three years before I'm going to trust my life to it. If it has issues, and many guns do, whether it's Glock or Sig or Smith & Wesson, many of a new model coming out can have issues. Give it a couple of years to work that out. Once that model has been established, if it doesn't have any issues, reliability, safety, anything like that, after that three-year period, then yeah, put it on the list. But as for now, I don't think it meets the criteria that I would like for a 22 defensive carry gun. With that, the tactical tip of the day. And if you're not a 22 person, I'm going to give you a tactical tip that has nothing to do with 22. Shotguns. You know, if I'm talking about a survival gun and I had to pick one long gun, it's going to be a shotgun if there's no other caveats. What if you have only birdshot? That's all you have on you. That's all you could get because you weren't paying attention and the economy collapsed or whatever the case is. And you can get a case of birdshot, but that's it but you need to maybe hunt larger game or use it for defense. There's a thing called a cut shell and a waxer slug. The cut shell is easier to make. I would practice this before it was an emergency to make sure you could do it and that it would work in your gun. But basically, if you hold a shotgun shell, most of them up to the light, up to the sky, you might be able to see where the wad is. If you don't know, generally there's a shot cup that holds the shot especially if it's bird shot, and then there'll be a wad, and then there'll be the brass. Where that wad is, you want to cut around that shell almost all the way. Leaving just a little bit, maybe in a quarter to an eighth of an inch on each side, with a pocket knife, a razor knife, whatever, so that when you fire, instead of the front of that shell opening and all the shot traveling down the barrel in the shot cup, the entire front end, the entire front end of that shot shell travels down the barrel and should stay together until it hits the target and at which point it will disperse. But if you had to use birdshot for defense, I don't recommend it. I'm not one of those people that tells you that that's a good idea. But if that's all you had and you wanted a more effective or a longer range thing, know that cut shells are a thing. A couple of caveats. Try this before it's an emergency. They may or may not work in pumps or semi-autos depending on how you cut them. Also, I would not use these through a full choke, maybe even a modified choke. I would use these through a cylinder bore. This is probably certainly not recommended by any manufacturers. If you hurt yourself or somebody else, it's your fault. But it is a thing that can be done. Next thing I'm going to talk about is wax slugs. If you look at the top of the shotgun shell, there's a crimp. You can open that crimp up, and something as simple as candle wax, old crayons, whatever it is, you can melt those and pour those down in there in the spaces between because spherical balls don't stack perfectly. In a cylinder, there's gaps in between. You can fill those gaps with the wax and let it cool, and then you have kind of, you may have heard these referred to as like a, a waxer, a wax slug, 
but basically you've held them together so that when they travel down the barrel they hopefully stay in one piece in one big projectile until they hit the target at which point they'll disperse neither one of these i don't think are nearly as good as you know double alt buck for a defensive option or especially not like a foster or a bernecki slug however if that's what you have you find yourself with an old single shot shotgun and some birdshot and that's all you have and you want to up your defensive game you might look at one of those things that's your tactical tip of the day tactical verse of the day the words of jesus i do not pray that you should take them out of the world but that you should keep them from the evil one i have come close to death many times in this life but god i have felt the kiss of death I have been on the brink, but God, God saved me. He is our refuge and strength. God made me, and he made you. We are made in his very own image. If you're still drawing breath, that is a blessing. If you're here in this world, remember the first two commandments. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment, and the second like it is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If you're still here, if you're listening to this, if you're drawing breath, that is a gift from God. That's a testament and a testimony to his abundant grace and mercy because none of us deserve it. And while we're in this world, let us seek to better love God and love our neighbor as ourself. Thanks for listening, and have a blessed day.